Okay, welcome everyone to the YouTube series on cybersecurity in digital mental health. Uh, today we're going to be talking about something that is probably one of the most mind blowing th topics that I've ever thought about in mental health space. Uh, so we're going to be talking about synthetic data in machine learning for mental health care. We're going to cover some methods, some risks and some opportunities. Um, while it might appear very computationally heavy, it, as the title suggests, I think that everyone should be aware of this topic. So we're going to try our best to keep it very high level and our guests will go into the weeds, into the details, but we'll try and bring it back out so that a broader audience can stay with us. Uh, a lot of things with ethics and trust and the public sphere, uh, policy law, it really is all attached to what we're talking about. So um, I'll also uh, be using a script for this conversation uh, because there are a lot of sensitive things that we're going to be discussing. So I am not an expert in synthetic data. Uh, I'm also not an epistemic trespasser, so I don't even pretend to be an expert in this space. Um, and I'm seeing this through an ethical lens. Um, so the overarching question that we're going to be looking, uh, exploring today with the guest is, to what extent can synthetic data be used to protect or exploit people's privacy. And we have an academic expert with us today who works deeply in synthetic data within a mental health care context. So I'd like to give a, a warm welcome to Julia I from Queen Mary University of London. And Julia, if you could introduce yourself to our guests and a little bit of background about you. Uh, hello, hi, uh, thanks a lot, Becky, thanks a lot for this wonderful introduction. Uh, so uh, I'm Julia Ive, I'm a lecturer in natural language processing at Queen Mary University of London, um, and throughout my research career I have been working in different approaches to text generation, that was multimodal text generation, summarization, I have been also working in machine translation, and recently, since 2018, I have been working in uh, synthetic text generation for mental health care. Um, and this has all started with a pilot project, pilot project that was funded by a research council uh, that allowed me uh, to study the possibilities and explore the pathways to, towards the generation of synthetic data for mental health care. What is also important is that after this pilot project, uh, uh, together with King's College London, we have organized a workshop um, with the patients uh, and, and stakeholders and policymakers uh, to get uh, the idea of the perception around, around the, the synthetic text generation for mental health uh, from a broader domain of stakeholders. Uh, that will be probably a very concise summary <laughs> about <laughs> what I have done in this domain, uh, and uh, I let Becky continue. Yeah, thank you, and we will we will go deeper. But that was a really nice holistic overview. And again, just a reminder to our viewers that the issues that we will be discussing are very sensitive. Obviously, mental health, and in a space where not many people are exploring, and Julia is really kind of paving the way here uh, with different stakeholders. So uh, I just ask people to try not to rush to any judgments and try to understand different perspectives and angles of this topic. Um, and so before we begin our interview or conversation, I just wanna set the scene a little bit here uh, because whether you know or not, you live in a world of synthetic data already. So whether it be from fakes to filters, fake news, body image editing filters, these kinds of fakes and filters can really disproportionately harm vulnerable people. And that's really what it's all about, ultimately trying to help protect vulnerable people. Um, but there's this new kind of fake that's emerging um, that a lot of people don't know, which is fake data or synthetic data. And there's an, a nice quote from uh, Richard Chen and colleagues, and it says that since the start of the pandemic, there has been an explosion of interest around the development of synthetic data in areas such as training AI algorithms, epidemiological modeling, digital contact tracing, and sharing data between hospitals. So this explosion and the contradiction of people, a lot of people not knowing what's going on, I think that's what makes this uh, kind of conversation really important, that we can broaden that, uh, that conversation. So we're going to break things down into four parts, because I like to have structure. <laughs> and the first part, uh, from the get-go, 
Julia, we will ask you what on earth is synthetic data? Because we've mentioned it already about 20 times, but we want to explain it on a very broad level uh, because there's different types of things. Uh, then we're going to move to the elephant in the room. So it's very important that we understand the risks and the bad that can be done with synthetic data or fake data. I want to make a huge distinction that that is not Julia's work. So Julia is not working on the elephant in the room, uh, but it's very important for us just to work through the the risks without interjecting uh, the opportunities. I'm just going to work through that. Uh, then we'll move to a deeper dive of Julia's work and we can sort of uh, demystify how synthetic data could be used for good uh, within a mental health context. Um, and then we'll just end with what the future might hold uh, and, and discuss other things, challenges, opportunities, the patient and public perspective, um, the importance of that, and how do we even regulate this kind of space. So uh, what, I'll start, uh, what I'll start off with is, Julia, help us, help us so much with what is synthetic data? What does it mean? There are face generators. There are synthetic text generators. So just on a high level, can you explain what, what that term is? Uh, thank you, Becky. Thank you. This is a very good question. And um, I will give my, my definition of synthetic data, how I see it. So this is the data that aggregates relevant information from the real data, enhance this real data without revealing uh, individual information, information that could be sensitive. So this um, second part is especially important uh, to emphasize uh, because as you might um, heard about is that uh, the, the models, the AI models trained with real data, uh, they actually do uh, have, have um, a capacity and uh, if, if they're not properly trained to reproduce the original data, meaning real data. Uh, and that's, that's what could result in some product of AI, which could be considered fake, but actually contains some parts of real data, the one that was used for model training. And for me, this is not proper synthetic data because it's just a mixture of, of real data, some compilation of real data. This is not what I call synthetic data. Um, so um, that's why I, we, we, we in, our, in our research group, uh, uh, we, we pay particular attention uh, to uh, the aspect of privacy preservation uh, and the aspect of proper training of AI models that do not memorize the training data uh, that they, they are built with. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll park that to the side and we'll come back and visit that in part three when we dive into your work in detail. Uh, but for now, on a higher level, I just want to address the elephant in the room, because you touched on a, a couple of points there. Um, so I just want to raise a few things from an ethics, legal perspective, um, and a few other perspectives, and just get your view on what the risk risk could be, not necessarily with your own work, but your, just your views generally. Um, so when it comes to synthetic data, uh, raising issues around ethics and the law, um, it's the example I always go to is the fake face generator, uh, which could come with like legal likeness issues, uh, especially when algorithms are trained on images that are scraped from the internet. It's harder to think about words uh, and the legal likeness when using synthetic text. But um, is there any other like legal or ethical things that you think about when you're doing your work? And is there any um, support that you can to get in order to actually do your work very safely? Or are you literally at the forefront and you're trying to create this, uh, the ethics and inform the, the, the law, I suppose. Um, so I'll just stop there and ask that question. Then I've got another ethics one. Uh, right. Thank you, Becky. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, I think that there is a lot of already uh, work that has been done in this domain. 
um, in terms of, um, in general, usage of, of language generation models. And there has been a lot of work done in our domain um, with respect uh, to reducing the bias of, of the uh, text generators. Um, and and not um, and and protecting the 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 text generation against uh, reproducing what was in the real data that the models we were trained on, um, and uh, um, I think that. Uh, the, the, the there is a lot to do, of course, from our side still, especially in the domain uh, of mental health, because this is the highly sensitive data. What I would rather say, this is uh, there is no more distinction in mental health data between some pri private information, uh, singular information like like names or phone numbers, for example, uh, and 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 some other elements that are neutral there is no longer this distinction. I think mental health text is by definition on its whole very private. Um, and this is something that uh, we are to address, that we are working on, that we need to establish a certain uh, ethical and legal framework for. for. But there is a large basis of work that has been done already um, in, in terms of general models, um, uh, and we are funding our work on, on this uh, established baseline already. And what is also very important is that, uh, especially in the recent couple of years, there has been a lot of work in our AI community about establishing the ethics of the research work. Uh, so um, uh, that the, there are now norms of, of um, um, uh, creating models with a responsible view of things. Uh, there are models uh, uh, of reporting results and, and building things with anticipation of what can happen further and and this is this is very important uh, because we we are at the forefront as becky you said at the forefront of of research and um there are uh, things that uh we need to anticipate uh because this is what to to, to see what can actually happen and foresee what can um what can result from our research even if there are already a lot of things that are investigated and known Hi, great, thank you. That really helped uh, set the scene as to where we are currently. Um, I've got one more ethics question and then we're gonna switch over to security and privacy uh, to see risks from that perspective. Um, but when it comes to uh, patient and public involvement, PPI, uh, you mentioned that you were reaching out to, uh, to PPI groups, which I think is absolutely fantastic and completely needed. Uh, and I'm borrowing language from Chen's paper, Richard Chen et al. Um, that it could be perceived as manufacturing pseudo realities or creating spurious imitations, or in my own words, putting words in people's mouths, it could be perceived that way. So um, especially when it comes to mental health with the ground truth being so important, um, Chen et al. again says, what is real? What constitutes authenticity? And how would the lack of authenticity shape our perception of reality? So um, again, just thinking about the ethical issues in the frameworks, I'm very pleased that uh, you're starting to uh, like think about those perspectives. Um, and if you'd like to comment further, uh, you, you can, otherwise I can uh, move to security, but I'll pause. Uh, yes, yes, Becky, that, that, was, uh, that was an excellent point. And I think it exactly touches the, uh, the point that I have made earlier. Uh, is that we need uh, a lot uh, to, to think a lot how the models that we build will be used and uh, how to legally establish a framework that will protect the uh, and restrict the usage to uh, good purposes. As everything in AI is, as every powerful tool that humanity has, uh, this tool could be used for uh, 
good purposes and for malicious purposes as well. Uh, and it's our responsibility uh, to take care of that, to anticipate malicious usage um, and uh, try to regulate and make sure that, that, that this usage does not happen. So I think it's, it's very important. Um, I do not say that uh, the models we build cannot be used for malicious purpose. Yes, they can, uh, but it's our responsibility to make sure this doesn't happen. Um, and also what is very important um, um, is that uh, the, uh, the amount of good and amount of bad that can come out of AI uh, is unknown. Uh, and uh, um, I think still that the amount of good is more than the amount of bad, and we just need to regulate what the, the bad, the bad uh, uh, situations that can arise from, from the usage of AI. Thank you. That was really important. Um, and so on that note, we're sort of talking about malicious acts. And an example comes to mind with fake impersonation videos, like deep fakes, how they can uh, propagate misinformation and fool facial recognition software. You could start to see that coming into mental health, maybe therapist verification fakes or other spaces. So it would be really important to anticipate, like you said, um, it will be yeah, I'm just very pleased that this is proactive anticipation uh, or anticipatory uh, ethics and policy. That's really the way forward. Um, so on a related note, uh, Maria Liakata, your colleague, she in a previous call, she mentioned uh, the research models. Um, how do we keep them available in the, the research community without inadvertently leaking them to places they shouldn't, which is what uh, you were mentioning as well. And it made me think of, um, well, for example, it could create vulnerabilities, which could lead to patient re-identification, as you mentioned, if adopted carelessly. But there was an, another interesting example from the Chen paper, where a clinician was working with developmental disorders and using a generative uh, model to capture uh, phenotype diversity in adolescence with a mutation. Um, and they made the weights of the trained generative adversarial network publicly available. And meaning that the model could be used by a third party to synthesize real faces of the adolescents. So a massive uh, potential PHI leak. Um, so to kind of put it back to a broader perspective, uh, we have researchers trying to do excellent uh, responsible work like yourselves, how do you juggle this uh, tension and traction of the, the idea of wanting to release your models, but doing it carefully? Uh, are you, you mentioned like legal frameworks and all these types of things. Um, is this one of the key priorities uh, of your work? Yes, of course, definitely, definitely. This is one of the key priorities and the situation that you have have described Becky, uh, they are well known, they're well known in the community and uh, uh, the, the, the release of weights um, in, in this way uh, cannot be done and now there are means to address such problems uh, and even in my recent work um, just to give you an example, we have, um, we have uh, performed careful checks on that um, and we have uh, performed special type of training uh, that will, uh, that will uh, uh, restrict uh, this kind of attempt. Um, and uh, of course, what is also very important is uh, the, the release, uh, controlled release of any model like that, uh, uh, so monitoring of, of the usage, how the model is used, to whom it's released, whether these uh, the people uh, we are releasing the models to are reliable, they work for research, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are there are two two main components to to prevent such situation. As I said, first there are um, AI AI methodologies that allow us. Um, to um, uh, to to avoid such such um, situations, and then of course careful monitoring of of the of the usage of the models that were released. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, 
And I promise you, we are getting to the, the positives and you're, you're doing a good job to, to reassure me. Um, but one of the main things, elephant in the room, uh, bias. So I know that we could see it in a positive light, but let's just see for now the, the potential bias or to exacerbate um, uh, discriminate through race or gender or other factors, uh, individuals being left out or issues around data representativeness and not including voices uh, to be heard. So um, are there any examples that you've seen where this has happened or the deployment has led to uh, extreme biases that you could comment on or just your thoughts around the risks of bias? Uh, yes, thank you, Becky. That's that's a very, uh, very good question. Um, and the first thing I would like to say about that is the bias is the natural um, consequence of how the, the AI models are trained. I have already said the statistical, the, the, the uh, synthetic data for me is aggregate, aggregate of relevant information from real data. That means those models, our models, they rely on statistics. They reflect uh, and, and exaggerate uh, what is in the real data and if the real data um, is biased towards something let me say in our training data we have more images than cats of cats than of dogs so naturally the model will learn uh, and and generalize the statistics to predict more cats than dogs so this is very natural and again this is the responsibility of the researchers uh, to take care of that to think about the data uh, what is uh, what is um, uh, now uh, is very much um, established in our community uh, is uh, training on, 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 on different, on multiple data sets uh, uh, so that, uh, that the, the aggregation will be more accurate. Uh, and again, uh, such situations are now, um, so now we have the methodologies uh, to, to, uh, to address those situations. Uh, and uh, in our research, in particular in mental health research, uh, it's very important. And um, this is the thing that also um, we are we are working towards uh, how to actually control the models in a way. Uh, that they address the biases. So even if the, the real data contain them and we cannot escape this and we just exaggerate them, uh, we are developing the means that, that help to address uh, those biases from, from the natural conditions they arise from. And we can go into maybe a specific example when we move to the, the positive opportunities. But um, yeah, so, so hold that thought. Um, and then the last example or elephant in the room, and this is just hypothetical, so I'd be curious to know your views on this. But when I think about um, um, bad, bad uses or exploitation of mental health spaces um, or profiting or commercialization of mental health, um, I could almost imagine the creation of synthetic data companies that would sell synthetic data to providers saying that they'd get a better signal or they'd improve the discovery of trends within their uh, service provision or something like that. So how do we, uh, like, I, I just don't know about that, but it just popped into my mind that people are going to be using the synthetic data just to generate, for, to serve their own means, and that's not always good. So from that perspective of the uh, companies trying to profit off of synthetic data to sell to providers or other spaces, and then I guess on a sort of related note, uh, even, for example, cyber criminals who are profiting from uh, just churning out synthetic data uh, that looks real on the dark web and things like that. So I don't know if we could just expand uh, a little bit about, you know, other risks or other stakeholders or um, threat agents that might be manipulating the mo very models that you're trying to protect. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this, this can, of course, um, what, 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 what I would like to mention here um, is also bias in the research. 
Um, uh, so uh, again, what, what I was trying to emphasize here that um, uh, pr primarily uh, what we're working towards uh, are data that uh, should mo most foremost help uh, the research um, and promote research, make research easier. Um, and of course, um, if, if the model is not trained uh, with the, for somebody, but, but if the model is trained by somebody who is not aware of the situation of the bias or not aware of, of, the, um, of the proper statistics uh, in their training data, uh, then of course there is a risk uh, that uh, the data that will be generated um, will be used for research and the conclusions will not be right. Um, and um, I think again, um, a lot of work has been already done uh, in, in, in terms of um, those aspects, those ethical aspects. Uh, and now um, in all the conferences, when, when the research, uh, where we, we, are, we, are, we are publishing our research papers, there are very strict procedures and very strict regulations uh, on, on the anticipation, on the thoughts that you need to put in your paper, how, um, how actually your model will be used. Uh, uh, we need to report uh, what has been done to avoid bias. Have we thought about bias? We as reviewers of those papers as well, because I participate in multiple committees for, for, for different conferences, AI conferences. Uh, so this is not uh, just purely responsibility of the author to take care of those uh, ethical means with respect of the bias, but also the, the responsibility of the peer review procedure where we as reviewers, we monitor, we flag potential dangers, we look into this. Um, and, and I think this is, uh, this is the, the further way forward. Um, of course, of course, there could be still situations that uh, that uh, uh, potentially uh, we do not anticipate, but I think the more we work towards it, uh, the more we look into it, uh, um, the better will be the outcomes, the more optimal will be our out outcomes. That's really nice because it's it's suggesting a culture shift in ethics within data science or computational spaces, which is very much needed. And it's just nice to be reassured that that's, that's happening within the community that is, as you say, flagging and just responsibly reviewing that kind of thing. That's definitely the way forward. So I'm going to just take a breath because we're now going to move <laughs> on to, uh, we're going to demystify some of your research. So we're going to go uh, a bit of a deeper dive. And now this is where I'd really love to hear, you know, all of the possibilities, the uh, exciting opportunities and things. So, uh, but I did promise the viewers that I would occasionally kind of provide a more broader uh, lens just to kind of zoom in and out. So um, I just wanted to um, read a quick example. And this is a positive uh, situation outside of mental health, where synthetic data has been used um, in, in a very productive way. So uh, I'll just read uh, this passage out. So uh, the study, which I will share, uh, put links to, demonstrated the capabilities of the AI-driven synthetic medical data generation. They produced images of three histological subtypes of renal cell carcinoma, by training a generative adversarial network with 10,000 real images of each subtype. And I promise I will sit, uh, paraphrase this at the end. And then compared the performance of the model with another model trained using both real and synthetic data. So that's a nice, uh, a nice study design there. So for instance, among renal cell carcinomas, um, subtype, there's a certain rare subtype that accounts for only 5% of the cases. And by providing synthetic histology images of the renal cell carcinoma as additional training input to a convolutional neural net, a detection accuracy of the subtype was improved. Now, I promise you, I, I promised I would go up and high, um, but it's a really nice example where 
uh, we see one subtype or category that just doesn't have enough representation uh, of images in this case for, for cancer. Um, and so they showed very systematically using a study design that you can use synthetic data to improve. Um, so I just wanted to just share that example in a non-mental health context, just to reassure people that there's some really great work as uh, Julia has also touched upon. There's a lot of advances that us outsiders might not be aware of. So um, on to looking at the, the benefits and I'll just kind of very, very quickly um, list a couple of things that I've noticed and then we hand it over to you, Julia, to really get into the details. But um, you mentioned data augmentation and just, um, it, it really could enhance reproducibility in research. Um, so in mental health, as, as you will well know, there's a lack of data sets um, and it's really hard to analyze less common outcomes or events or, or things with not a lot of data. Um, and this is a problem that's called class imbalances where you just, uh, you really struggle to find that rare disease or the rare um, data point or something like that. So there was an interesting paper by Belcher, JAMA Network 2019, uh, prediction models for suicide attempts and deaths. It was a systematic review and simulation. So I, again, I'll put that link there, but it was a positive use for uh, what is in the data science world, a rare or more rare or less common event and how they could use simulations uh, to improve the signal in the data. Um, so I think that's just one quick point. And the, uh, the second point that synthetic data could transform interoperability standards and just the sharing of healthcare data. Uh, and you mentioned before linking this with differential privacy uh, for protecting um, the health information from people. So I think that would be a very interesting thing if you wanted to also touch on that. Um, and just the importance of if you have accurate synthetic data, how it could do the opposite of what we discussed above, and you can increase diversity in data sets and increase the robustness and adaptability of the uh, AI models. So uh, in, in theory, it could be emulating data of underrepresented conditions or uh, individuals. Uh, so it really is, when we discuss the negatives, you could really flip it to a positive. That's why I wanted to tease that apart. And um, and, and I'll stop there because um, I just want to hear your thoughts on just the general uh, opportunities, and then we will dive into your work. Uh, yeah, Becky, that's uh, that's an excellent, uh, very good point. So um, I think that's uh, probably evident that um, synthetic data can really boost uh, research possibilities because. What is happening now is that separate groups work on separate data sets. They build their own models in some restricted conditions. Uh, nor data, no models are usually shared. So this really handicaps uh, the, the, the development, the progress with this respect. So we cannot do any aggregated statistics. Uh, we cannot work on the transferabilities of the models. Um, and, uh, and I think that synthetic data is uh, optimal in this case uh, to really uh, help research and promote research. There is also such an important uh, point that I would like to make here is that synthetic data is also extremely important for teaching and pedagogical purposes. Um, this, um, um, especially um, for, for mental health, when there are a lot of support members that, uh, that are needed, uh, sometimes urgently on the phone line, um, and and the, this, uh, this is very difficult to train those specialists. Uh, and here, uh, synthetic text can really um, um, enhance and make this process easier because um, if we can uh, um, help people to feel themselves in this situation, they, they will be feeling in, in the emergency when they face somebody 
uh, who is in a mental state crisis, um, that that will really change um, and, and improve uh, the situation with, with such help. Uh, then um, uh, the, the third the third point. Oh, sorry, so I, sorry, I, Julia, can I just jump in there and say that's a fantastic point. That's such a huge point. And as a, a tangent slightly, it reminded me of the Trevor Project um, in America, and they work with LGBTQ plus community, and they created a chatbot. And the chatbot was used to train their um, support staff before they then went on to work with individuals who were in crisis. So it's just it's, it's a separate example, but it, it's such a really a really nice example that um, it is very important. So thank you for that. Yes, Becky, I agree. I, I think that that's, that is a very, very actual uh, example. Uh, what's, uh, so, so far I have been also always talking about research, uh, but um, in spite of what you said, Becky, and what in spite of what I said, I think there is also a way of good collaboration between research and industry as well. Um, and um, uh, as I said, research goes very fast forward and industry usually inherits uh, the most stable methodologies and approaches from research. And I think this inheritance that that could be very much facilitated by the use of synthetic data. Again, uh, under the condition that uh, the, uh, the, the norms, certain norms are respected and the industrial partners are trustworthy and established um, industrial collaborations uh, uh, with, um, with, with already some good experience in the domain. Uh, so the second point I would like to um, comment on that, that Becky, you, you also touched upon is the um, generation of um, uh, rare conditions and the missing data, the data sparse. It's a very important point. And actually, um, how would I say a bit later, uh, this is something uh, that, um, that our models, um, the, the models we build are also um, could be used for uh, is the um, a generation of, of the data that uh, simply are too sparse or maybe even non-existent. So this is a modeling. Uh, uh, th this is again, uh, very connected to the problem that uh, the current data that we have are very often collected in very restricted conditions. Um, they, they, they could be, for example, co 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 collected only for certain um, layers of populations, only for, for, certain, uh, uh, for certain ethnical groups, for example, for different historical reasons. Uh, and we simply do not have any other data. And, and synthetic data is a very efficient way to go forward. Uh, to uh, project the statistics over other population groups and improve fairness in research in other domains than AI. Yeah, and so going back to the study design that the um, mm -hmm. I was mentioning earlier, the non-mental health example, are you doing research or is there a plan to do research where you look at real data and then versus synthetic and real data and just really cross-checking any similarities differences and just is that something that you do currently or would would be doing um uh, do you mean becky um comparing uh, yes. the, the the real data and the fake data with the human experts whether they can distinguish between oh no data? no i'm um, more uh, having a, a training set of real data and then having a training set of real data plus some uh, data augmentation with synthetic data. So just looking at pure real data versus data that's supplemented with synthetic as well. And just looking at, at what happens statistically comparing yes, those. Yes, absolutely. So okay. yep. uh, the, the paper that um, we have published um, in, in 2020 that did exactly this study. Yep. And this is one of the main ways to evaluate the models. That's, that's, uh, that's uh, how we prove 
uh, the validity of what we generate. Yes, this is absolutely a valid example. Uh, and, and, and this is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, benchmarks the creation of our synthetic data. So um, um, for different reasons, um, and, and primarily for, for, for AI models, yes. That's great. So I'll make sure that, again, that your that paper that you just referenced and anything else can be made available. Um, and now thinking broader again, so we're now thinking not just with the academic lens here, but how could other um, sectors or stakeholders use synthetic data for good? So uh, again, hypothetical example, uh, not a real example, but if governments or organizations could use synthetic data to sort of lure or um, target cyber criminals who are selling fake data. Uh, so you could actually create fake data to lure people in. Um, but, but again, I just wondered if you had any other lens uh, apart from the research lens where others could benefit. You mentioned the training, uh, which is great because that could be uh, rolled out or deployed to charities or uh, other things as well. Uh, was there any other angle that you think could be a real asset to uh, helping keep mental health safe from different from different uh, stakeholders using synthetic data. Uh, yes, of course. The, I think I think there are multiple layers where it could be used. Uh, um, it, it's also very important for the whole sociological analysis of the society. Um, I, I think that there are very interesting parallels that could be uh, could be made um, with synthetic and real data. As I said, we can actually. Um, fill in the gaps in the existing data with synthetic data and project the differences, see the different evolutions, so predict what will be what will be uh, possible uh, and, and, and see um, and, and effectively uh, put the missing points into the picture of the data that we have now. Uh, so I think it has very broad use um, on on the on the social um, on the social level in general. Okay, thank you. So we can now dive a bit deeper into uh, some of the projects that you're working on, or some of your, I suppose, most um, uh, fascinating findings or things that have really stuck with you. And just before we do, I just had one question before you uh, start to talk about specifically synthetic text generation. Um, how does that overlap or um, relate to other free text redaction algorithms? So for people, again, just to broaden this, um, that when someone's using an app and they're not asked to provide any personal information, but then they say something about the school they go to or just something that's um, uh, personally identifiable information. Uh, so there are algorithms like PII redaction algorithms that are used to kind of uh, minimize the incidence of accidental um, uh, yeah, exposure or uh, inclusion in the system. But how does what you do differ from um, these redaction algorithms or overlap? Yeah, yes. Thank you, Becky. Thank you. That's a very nice question. Um, I would like to say that, um, refer to the point that I, I mentioned earlier, that um, mental health um, uh, text, it's private by its definition. So everything um, we share, if we share something about our mental health issues, is private. Uh, there is no... Um, such uh, such thing as the separation that those applications you mentioned make. There is no information that could be hidden uh, some some parts of, of, of sentences or, or some names, some addresses and and, and the other information uh, it just just not could cannot be considered not private. There are indirect references, and and even so, for example, uh, by by saying the exact name of the person, uh, we, we directly refer to this person. But then we can also mention where this person worked. 
and what uh, what does this person do or maybe he appeared in some social media and that's how we can actually identify this person so there are multiple indirect references and and with respect to mental uh, health text I think the the big thing here is that even if nobody can identify you from this text whatever whatever you say whatever you try to express nobody will just want this overall private information to be shared with anyone and that's why the the approaches that you mentioned they allow just to change some certain fragments of text uh, that are uh, that directly identify somebody and what synthetic sex generation does is that we create completely new completely different text that just sketches some tendencies some generalized tendencies uh, in uh, in in certain mental health conditions for example so there is no uh, no, not no pers personalized information there. No personalized feeling. No personalized emotion. Mm -hmm. And so, just going back to the the second part of my question, what is the the sort of the hot topic or the thing that you, gets you really excited at the moment uh, that you're working on? If you wanted to just um, the the viewers could just learn a little bit more about, I guess, the cutting edge of the cutting edge. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Becky. So uh, what I really would like to mention here is the um, uh, just the 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 essence a bit on the essence a bit of, of language um, generation. Uh, so the whole procedure could be resumed to um, a model that uh, that is statistical model that will predict every next word depending on the previously seen words, previously seen sequence of words. Um, so this is the general operation. Um, and um, in order for this text to preserve some relevant content, relevant content that will be needed for research, this process of generation could be guided. And, and that's what's, what we are working on, the correct means to guide this generation process so that the relevant part, the relevant statistical part for the uh, uh, useful for, for the research will be respected, but the rest of the text will be not revealing, not uh, not breaching any any privacy norms, um, and uh, in my paper, the one that I have already mentioned, uh, this content preservation is ensured by keywords, and that's all also uh, keywords related to some diagnosis, uh, to certain characteristics um, of the situation that will inform the model on how to proceed on generation. So the text is relevant. Um, and um, this is uh, very much in the, in the line what we have talked about the bias. So this is how the model could be controlled to generate the missing information. If we ask the model to generate missing with relevant keywords. So this research is now continued further. There are also other more sophisticated means to, to control the content. Um, and uh, I, I really think that is a very um, nice way to go forward um, and very encouraging way to go forward. And the second point that I would like to emphasize is um, particular particular care that we pay for the for the privacy aspect um, so again Becky you mentioned those um, suppression of uh, certain fragments of text direct references to privacy addresses phone numbers um, which are very limited so what we are trying to do uh, we are trying uh, to remove 
all of the rare outlier information from the input data, the data that our models are trained on to reduce um, some, some kind of uh, information that could potentially appear in the output and reveal something about the, the real data. Then uh, we use different means. So this is a combination of privacy preserving techniques. There is also means to train the model in the way so that the data, the real data is not memorized. And then finally, we are working on paraphrasing techniques, the, the techniques rewriting the text on the top of the generation model, uh, so that again, we preserve only the relevant content, uh, but uh, the means of expression, the means of expressing this context will not relate to any private uh, private information, private characteristics, whatever private uh, a person could express in in what they are saying or what they're writing. Okay, that is fascinating. That's just like, I didn't even have space to stretch my mind, but you did. You managed to get a little bit more in my brain. Uh, I'd love to read more about that when the work comes out. And again, I'll share uh, any of these uh, future thinking projects and stuff you've got um, on the go. So, um, yeah, that's really interesting when you start playing with the tales of the uh, the, the outliers and things. But um, so I think we need to wrap up because I've taken a lot of your time, but we'll cover just uh, briefly to end future directions. And you mentioned um, that the patient and public perspective work. Um, I'd love to know, uh, is that going to be published at some point or what stage are you at with that um, that work? Uh, I, I'm very hopeful. <laughs> we are working currently on the paper, uh, and uh, I guess that will be within in the coming months. Uh, okay. We expect uh, to submit it, and then uh, uh, hopefully <laughs> <laughs> we will move forward in this process. <laughs> but yes, we are we are already having some. Uh, uh, some some sketches and uh, some uh, some drafts uh, that are being prepared on this work. Yes. That is fantastic. Okay, so again, I'm going to uh, just send that my way and I'd love to check that out. Um, on a, I guess, slightly related note, um, but not directly to your work, I was reading an ODI uh, newsletter, so the Open Data Institute, and I'm just going to read this part out because I found it fascinating, again, from a public and trust perspective. But um, so this study participants were asked to distinguish between images of an AI generated or a real face. So, um, and what they found was the accuracy, uh, it was 48% uh, or up to 59. So it boosted a little bit if the people were trained to recognize those that were computer generated. So fine. Uh, the study also asked participants to rate how trustworthy they believed the faces to be. And on average, the AI faces were rated 8% more trustworthy, a small but significant difference, according to the researchers behind the study, uh, who've warned about the potential harm these realistic fakes can cause. But it's just a really interesting angle. Um, and I don't know if there's any way you, you would uh, use that type of study design or ask people, I don't, I don't know how it could work, but it just made me very interested to see how people uh, either distinguish or prefer certain images. And I have no idea why, but um, so I thought I would just ask about that and then um, end on, you know, the, how do we regulate this space? How do we create frameworks? And just to, um, well, let's start first with the the distinguishing between fake and real. Um, uh, <laughs> yes, Becky, I, I totally agree with you. That's an excellent example um, for for image recognition <laughs> or yeah. or image uh, creation. I think we are a bit far from this point yeah. of the generation of text. Uh, so the text is such a structure that has multiple layers and the distinction between real and fake could be at a very shallow level and could be at a very deep content contextual level of the situation. Mm -hmm. And even if you hear a lot of um, things about um, 
language model um, generating human-like text, uh, reaching human parity. Uh, this could be true for certain situations, uh, though uh, this, this all should be taken with a large grain of salt. Um, for the main reason, uh, because the, the, the contextual, the content parts um, is not always correctly reflected by the language models, especially in very difficult cases where the accuracy is um, should be should be really um, well respected, like in the mental hair care domain. Um, so um, the the experiments um, you 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 mention. Um, Usually in the text generation domain, uh, they just uh, they are they are also they are also very often done, and depending on the situation on the particular model, they could be very different. So it could be um, it could be a situation where humans really prefer the generated text to real text, depending again on the situation, on the model, on the data set, on on the on the particular condition. Um, and I think that um, your point with ethical regulations around it is also very important. I, I think that uh, text generation will progress a lot and um, uh, by by using by, by by actually staging such experimentations, the one that you mentioned, we will progress even even faster uh, and, uh, um, we need to start to think now about the things, um, how the situation will be handled. Um, and I think a good way forward is to somehow create a, an ID or mark uh, for the um, artificial text. So that even, even and, and, and establish some framework that will regulate uh, the usage um, and the deployment of those ideas, so that uh, if if the synthetic text exists, it will be used and treated as such, having a, a, a particular um, identification um, that that will restrict its usage to um, to conditions where it should be used. That is incredible. Um, okay, you've given me so much food for thought. And um, I suppose just in concluding and a couple of remarks, uh, I'm a co-chair of the IEEE IC program on eth ethical assurance in data-driven technologies for mental health. So even opening up a space uh, for that conversation and the work that you're doing to bring that in, it could be one one opportunity or way to uh, head towards or have an ethical discussion that heads towards standards and regulations. So I'd happily follow that up um, with you, Maria, and others. Um, and I suppose that my, my concluding point, and then over to you, is just that a lot remains unclear still um, about synthetic data and AI systems, and most definitely for mental health uh, being one of, well, sorry, the most precious, in my opinion, uh, data. So a lot is unclear, but there's a lot of uh, opportunity, and we need a lot of people to be involved in the, the conversation. Uh, but over to you, Julia, for last thoughts or remarks before we finish. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Becky. I, I fully support you on, on your message. And what I would like to add, I think, is the um, what we need to invest on is the engagement um, with the community, uh, with, the, with the patients, uh, with people um, who would um, who who actually uh, contributes uh, to 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 this data, and that we 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 really need uh, to understand um, better um, what what will be the best uh, norms of of preserving and protecting uh, the usage of 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 the of the synthetic data and what will be the best norms of, of protecting the, the, the privacy of, of the people 
um, who contribute to the mental health data that uh, further will be potentially used um, for the AR models. In, in spite of all the, all the efforts that we do now, I think communications with uh, people is especially important for anticipating further issues. The one that uh, help us to, to secure the ethical ground for the further usage of text generation and, and synthetic data. That was well said, Julia. Um, you've already got me inspired thinking about community and communication. I work with the music industry and hip hop, so I've got some thoughts, but I'll uh, not drop them here. I will um, just uh, end with a, a, a massive thank you uh, for just speaking so well about a topic that is just extremely just mind blowing. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your patience and uh, this uh, taking time to to be interviewed. Thank you so much, Becky. That was very, very, very.